All right, welcome back. This is Professor Spira, and we are talking about pus, mucus, and or acid forming foods. And next is dairy products, which are indeed pus forming. We have butter made from cow's milk or some other kind of animal milk, uh, buttermilk, cheese, all kinds of cheese, cream, <laughs> cream fresh, <laughs> uh, kefir, milk, all animals and kinds, raw, organic, skim, one or two percent, etc., all milks, and yogurt. Now, dairy is highly addictive. And again, I talk a little bit about my own transition off of dairy. There are certain dairy products that are worse than others. In the mucus's diet, Arit recommends if, if you just really, really need some dairy in the early stages of the transition, something like cottage cheese is recommended or yogurt. And the reason is because they, they still create waste and are not good for the body, but they eliminate better than ch regular cheese that just turns into this gloppy, gluey mess in your intestines that are, that's almost seems impossible to really eliminate properly. So, uh, but cheese, dairy was, was something that well, I'll tell you, my body started to force me to get up, get off of cheese. When I was in high school, by the time I was about 16 or 17, I was, I guess what people call lactose intolerant, which we all to a certain extent are, or should be, some of us might have uh, more of a tolerance but ju just the fact that you could <laughs> that, that we would use the term intolerant lactose intolerance that some humans would become intolerant to this unnatural processed uh, uh, I'll say cow piss or animal <laughs> animal I, know. I used to call milk uh, cow piss I saw a documentary that called it that yeah, and i don't mean to be crude, but it that it instilled that idea in me like that. That's what it is. You know, of course, if I have to break down or define the word piss. It's, uh, you know, just meaning the excretion of some kind of fluid from the body. And, you know, when we deal with cow or goat or whatever the animal is, we're not only are we not drinking or consuming something that would be natural i don't i don't see how humans could have really came to the conclusion that there's anything natural about drinking the milk that comes from an animal that comes from that's meant for a baby calf or a baby goat or whatever the animal may be uh, human milk is not like cow milk it's it's a uh, uh, it's, it's it's chemically it's a bit it's a bit different and a lot of people say you know, humans after the age of two can't even deal with human milk so this dairy thing has become uh, quite an interesting epidemic that we would get deeper and deeper into uh, th these dairy addictions and uh, the ice cream. When you start to really think about the, the process that goes into making these things, yes, uh, I used to watch documentaries on milk and they put, I forget the name of the what it is, but there's something in the milk. They, they add this stuff that's almost uh, so incredibly addictive and they put as much of that into this processed cooked milk uh, as possible and it's 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 just it's pus forming <laughs> and a lot of people 
start to see that a lot of people get so much relief just by getting off of meat and dairy, just scrapping the pus forming foods and finding alternatives that has helped a lot of people get over a lot of ailments and feel a lot better. Of course, you have to go through the initial stages of the addiction, the initial stages of feeling like, oh, man, I never could give that up. I never want to give that up. You know, that's that, that's the voice of your addiction. That's not you saying that. That's that part inside of you that wants to hold on to this thing that we have become physiologically dependent upon. We've gotten so used to this poison that our body craves it and is problematic. But again, transition, transition, transition. Nobody's saying to just scrap it all right away. Uh, like I said, dairy. I would put dairy into that category. It took me about six months before I was totally off of all dairy. Uh, I was still you know, several months into the diet. I might relapse and have a piece of pizza or something, and that was, uh, you know, what I was going through. But the big, the huge difference was instead of just having that pizza by itself, now I'm having a huge salad surrounding it, to the, where to the point where I feel like I can't even attempt to eat this without having a huge, huge salad to help help it eliminate uh, and I sort of emphasize this transition and tell you these personal experiences so that you don't feel bad when you relapse or you is you shouldn't but you should you want to hold on to the desire to get off of the pus and mucus forming foods you hold on to that and understand that if you keep practicing the transition eventually you're going to get off of uh, off of these foods. So let's move on. Uh, cereals, moderately mucus forming. So I wanted to kind of uh, give a little bit more detail as to how mucus forming certain things are, because uh, again, certain things are much worse than others to use while you're on the transition and cereals are one thing that people can use within moderation during the transition for a, for a longer period of time but not all of them but some of them we have barley we have breads all kind of breads uh, barley black rye white graham pumpernickel zweibach etc we got cereal grains, all kinds, maize, uh, farina, uh, comet, millet, oak, canoa, spelt, white rice, brown rice, whole or refined wheat, etc. Cornmeal, pseudo cereals uh, such as amar amaranth, buckwheat, chia, uh, uh, coxcum. Uh, quinoa, uh, canoa, etc., and pastas. And so a few things about the grains. Now, in more recently, in recent years, after having practiced the diet for quite some time, I've experienced a bit of kind of this, what, what people have come to call gluten intolerance. And that's sort of the new, in some ways, it's, it's, it's kind of becoming a fad because there's people in the, in, as, in the industry, as people start getting away from wheat and start getting away from even the dairy and the meat, the capitalists want to take advantage of people moving away from these foods. So they don't want you to, to move too far away. They don't want you to get too far into fruits and vegetables. So they start to create an entire industry around, okay, what can we feed you that you're not intolerant of today? And so they've created an entire aisles full of so-called gluten-free uh, foods. And that's something I'll maybe talk more about uh, a little later on in some other videos. I'll get into this gluten 
issue because there's many people that practice a diet and as you read the mucus's diet book uh, arnold Errett says you know use the the toasted wheat bread is something that is recommended in the mucus's diet as a transitionary tool i used 100 percent wheat spaghetti in the early years to help transition off of meat and but a lot of that stuff I I can no longer mess with or I really 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 feel it and so but for me that's just a natural progression uh, physiologically uh, where the cleaner I get the more intolerant my body becomes to mucus forming foods and that's what I wanted <laughs> as as somebody that has a goal of wanting to eliminate mucus forming foods from my diet that became uh you know something that when it you know when it started to happen I was kind of like okay I saw kind of saw the writing on the wall like okay I really got to totally let go of the wheat at this point I can't look back I got to keep moving forward because if when I mess with it I have some pretty nasty symptoms so but again in the beginning you can use some of the cereals to help transition and there's a lot more detail about that in the, uh, the transition diet portion of the mucus's diet healing system so I will end this section there and stay tuned for the next where we will continue talking about pus and mucus forming foods peace love and breath